Good morning, everyone. I am Dongyeon Park of ADB's research department, and I'm the host of today's Asian Impact Webinar on the second wave of Malaysia Aging and Retirement Survey, or MARS. Aging-related surveys such as MARS are indispensable for evidence-based policies that improve the well-being of older Asians. Over the past couple of years, ADB has collaborated closely with the Social Wellbeing Research Center of University Malaya to conduct, to conduct MARS. ADB support for Malaysia Aging and Retirement Survey was made possible by a Japanese government-funded technical assistance program on healthy and productive aging in Asia. MARS is truly an excellent example of ADB's firm commitment to promoting the well-being of older Asians through both operations and knowledge products. My colleague Aiko Kikawa, who is leading ADB's knowledge support for aging-related surveys in developing Asia, will moderate today's Asian Impact webinar. Over to you, Aiko. Thank you, Don Hyun, for your introduction. Let me introduce myself. My name is Aiko from the ADB's uh, research department, and I welcome all of you to this seminar that share the insights from the survey in Malaysia. Today, we have three, one distinguished presenter, followed by a, a, a panelist, uh, two discussions. Let me introduce one of them each. Professor Mans Norma Mansour, Director of Social Wellbeing Research Center at the University of Malaya, and also the principal investigator of the Mars, will be here to present the outcome of the Mars that is just completed, was launched last week. Followed by her presentation, we would have a panel discussion with two joining by two panelists. Here we have Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. David Whaler, a research professor in Survey Research Center and in, at the Institute of Social Research at the University of Michigan. He's the Director of Health and Retirement Survey, which is a longitudinal survey in the US. And this is, mod, this is served as a model for similar surveys across the world, including Asia. We also have Meredith Weiss uh, from ADB, who is a Senior Social Development Specialist, Aging and Care. And she's been uh, she's long been long been working for our region on the issue related to older person, and also on the program related to social protection, community development, and health. So here uh, I would first would like to invite Noma to present the key findings from the Mars. Thank you, Aiko, and good morning, everyone. Thank you. And before I proceed, um, let me thank the uh, ADB for giving us the, the opportunity to share some of the insights or some uh, with some focus on the findings of Mars. But before that, let me uh, thank um, Professor David Weir, uh, who has uh, from the um, HRS uh, University of Michigan, who has supported, strong support uh, with the technical aspect of the survey, uh, without which we would not be able to um, implement the survey. Also, our part uh, support uh, that we receive from the, um, the Employees Provident Fund and also uh, Social Security Organization, so, so Malaysia, we are grateful for the support. Just to give the context of the uh, survey, um, I will give some background uh, um, information on where we are in Malaysia with regards to aging. Population aged for Malaysia um, 60 and older was 11% in 2020. It has increased rather rapidly to 18%. Um, it would increase to 20 to 18% in 2040, and by 2050, 24% of the population, which is about 10 million. And this is rather uh, fast for Malaysia because uh, France took 115 years to reach uh, where Malaysia is whereas Malaysia is taking only 25 years. And population age 60 are overrepresented, meaning that they are among the uh, bottom 40% of the income group in Malaysia, which is about 44% of them. 
And the majority of these older people in Malaysia are working in the informal sector. And uh, social protection uh, in Malaysia focuses on the low income group uh, and the formal sector, thus leaving out the informal uh, sector workers. There is also evidence of the prevalence of non-communicable diseases such as hypertension, high cholesterol and diabetes, which, has uh, which would increase the vulnerability of the aged population. Supportive long-term care services that cater to the needs of aged population in Malaysia are very limited. And uh, also from COVID the pandemic, um, we could observe that the aged population is susceptible to the pandemic as well. However, the Malaysian government do recognize the, uh, the scenario or the demographic change uh, among the Malaysian population. And in the 12th Malaysia plan, which covers the period of 2021 to 2025, aims to increase the well-being of the aged population by enhancing care and support for older persons and strengthening social protection. The uh, motivation behind uh, conducting the Malaysian aging, Malaysia Aging Retirement Survey is to produce a comprehensive micro-level micro data on various aspects of aging. And um, although uh, Malaysia has the uh, household income and also the expenditure survey, but this not longitudinal, longitudinal it is a cross-section which was conducted every three years. Whereas MARS is a longitudinal data which collects information on life histories and experiences of middle-aged beginning from 40 years old over time to, in order to gain a, a deeper understanding of the issues and challenges associated with retirement and aging. It is evidence-based. We are supporting policies to address trends arising from population aging in Malaysia. And the data is comprehensive, covering six components on the individual, the family, social, economic, and health situations. And uh, we want to be part of the global platform in order for us to be comparable and understand um, our position with regards to aging and, the, and, the, and to track um, the aging population in Malaysia and how are we doing compared to other countries. And hopefully learning from other countries pro would provide innovative solutions for us uh, uh, and also for other countries. The components of Mars uh, are the following, family support and living arrangement, income and consumption, housing, savings, assets, and financial literacy. And financial literacy is important because our funder is also the Employees Provident Fund, who are very concerned about the um, adequate um, financial uh, protection in old age. Psychosocial, work, employment, and retirement, health and healthcare utilization, health insurance, long-term care, and impact of COVID and social protection. And the, um, this is the new uh, component, uh, where, whereas in, in wave one, we did not have the component on, um, we did not have any question, questions on the impact of COVID. Um, and uh, for this uh, session, uh, for, this, for our discussion this morning, we are focusing on four main issues. Uh, on non-communicable diseases, on the long-term care needs, on social assistance, and the impact of COVID. As a background, these are the number of respondents that we get in wave two. Uh, wave two is a smaller number compared to wave one, and out of uh, 4,821, 75% are panel, panel respondents, and the new respondents, about 25%. And we did this in order to uh, further improve on our sampling where in wave one, we were lacking among uh, Chinese uh, ethnic group and uh, urban, uh, urban areas. The profile of respondents are uh, majority female um, and the majority are married uh, and the uh, majority Malays with the primary education and, and also uh, a place of residence are urban. And this is in line with the demography of the Malaysian population. Uh, where about 70 uh, to 80% are living in the urban areas. We ask, on, we ask the, the respondents to rate on their health and, uh, um, and the diseases. Half of the respondents rated themselves to be in good health, 
but more than half have at least one doctor diagnosed disease. And um, as you can see from the data that um, the top three uh, doctor diagnosed, uh, top three diseases are hypertension, high cholesterol and diabetes. And the respondents in treatment uh, for diabetes and also hypertension and high cholesterol as indicated in the, in the chart. When we measured uh, the blood pressure, because um, uh, Mars survey also uh, take the biomarkers and um, measure the blood pressure. And we found out that out of the um, uh, those who are not diagnosed, um, that 30% um, are unaware of their condition. Uh, so this is of concern because uh, it would indicate that um, they are more susceptible to facing um, problems of hypertension. And um, respondents uh, by hypertension, uh, with hypertension uh, is higher among, among males. And the blood pressure readings uh, of the doctor diagnosed hypertension and currently on medication does show that 45% still have high BP reading, even though they were on medication. So this could be the uh, either the medication is not working or um, they are not taking the uh, medication. The question on obesity, we can see that 42% uh, are um, reported uh, obese um, and, um, and the gender, you could see that is uh, higher among female. And 75%, when we take the waist circumference, 75% uh, have abdominal uh, obesity and also by gender, it shows that female participants or female respondents have higher um, uh, tendency or have a greater tendency to uh, to have to be to be obese. Um, we did ask a question on whether there is a need for long term care in old age, and about 41 percent of the respondents needed long term care in old age, um, and. Uh, whether they agree that they did it, needed the long-term care was also asked. And as you can see, the older that they get, the more that they feel that they needed the long-term care. And uh, the, it's higher among female uh, than men. On the self-rated health, you can see that um, they are reported, uh, the poor, uh, um, reported poor is in the majority. We did ask a question whether Malaysians are prepared to live in assisted living facility. Only 17% are prepared to live in assisted living facility. And as you can see that um, the older they get, the less, um, less prepared they are to, to live uh, um, away from their homes. And this is, is about the same with male and female, yeah. And um, we also, um, because uh, there have been discussions about whether um, we should make um, make it mandatory for children to support for their parents in Malaysia. So uh, we posed a question to the participants and 86% agreed that the government should make it mandatory for children to support their parents. A question on preparedness to receive home health service or assistance. Uh, our respondents, uh, <clears throat> more than half of the respondents are prepared to receive home health service assistance and the proportion of male respondents is higher than female uh, respondents. There's a section on uh, social assistance and, and this um, group of questions um, does help um, our Ministry of uh, Finance in order for them to, to, um, uh, to see the uh, efficiency and the effectiveness of the social assistance uh, provided to uh, Malaysians, to the um, low-income Malaysians. And uh, we post this question, and this question is also uh, now uh, part, become part of our work with the Ministry of Finance. Um, for the social assistance question, 
51% of the households receive at least. So for social assistance question, we look at household because um, although the um, mass survey is on an individual, but in this case, we do ask whether uh, other household members receive uh, any social assistance and 51% did receive social assistance and 5.3% in kind, but the majority receive it in cash. And the number of assistance, um, uh, uh, the majority or 61% receive only one type of assistance, whereas 36% receive uh, two to, to four. So it could be in the form of um, um, uh, so uh, old age assistance for hardcore poor, um, the social assistance, the cost of living assistance. It could also be for the disability assistance. Yeah. So the financial assistance, the amount of the financial assist assistance, as you can see, the majority received, uh, or rather 42%, uh, received 1,200. Um, so uh, the majority received up to the maximum of 2,000 ringgit. So the top three social, social assistance are the cost of living, COVID-19 related cash assistance, the disability aid. Um, we did ask a question on whether they need social assistance. And um, as you can see, household needing social assistance, about 57% receive social assistance. And household who did not need social assistance, uh, did not receive social assistance, 54% did not receive, but 43% receive social assistance. So this is something that will be uh, of interest to the government. And the social assistance application experience also indicated that a good percentage, about 30, 33% say, say that I, they do not know of any assistance available or how to apply. Yeah. So this is uh, uh, of concern uh, uh, to many governments, I think, because uh, when you are targeting uh, the poor and if you miss them, you exclude them, uh, this is uh, where uh, a lot of work has to be done into getting it more publicized or uh, to reach the targeted group. The impact of COVID-19 on the psychological impact, uh, you can see uh, uh, that um, a good percentage feel very lonely and uh, slightly higher percentage among male and uh, anxious and stressed living in confined space, about 40%. And on the family re relationship, um, those who are sad due to not being able to meet family members, um, about 61% um, and feel closer to the family, 52%, uh, and it is higher among male, uh, sorry, higher among female who feel sad for not being able to uh, meet family members. On the financial impact, whether they have uh, the income has been reduced. Um, as the figure shows that the reduced income from business, about 60% uh, 60, 60 and uh, higher among male, and this is because uh, our data uh, also shows that there are more uh, male working uh, than female. Reduced income or salary, 62%, uh, 58%, uh, 58, 59% and uh, higher among uh, uh, males and financial, financially affected about 56%. Uh, and on the daily life, whether they stay informed with, with related news, uh, this is the highest uh, um, activity that they do. And uh, about 90% or very big percentage will read about their own family and their own family's health during COVID. Um, and um, my presentation ends there. Um, and if you wish to download the full report with further analysis, on the findings, which is not just confined to the four areas that I have shared earlier, but also on all the components of mass, please uh, uh, download the report and you can scan the QR code on the screen now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Norma, for your comprehensive presentations. And it really shows how rich this you know, survey that really goes out and asks people about very uh, important policy questions can help policymakers uh, in, to inform policymakers. And just to you know add that this is, is a micro data, so you can also do 
all kinds of disaggregation. Is it by region, by gender, by age? We need to help policy uh, policymakers in that respect. So uh, maybe I would uh, first start by asking the initial reaction from the panelists on this. And maybe I'll start with uh, David. Uh, and particularly, perhaps uh, he could also highlight and also you know, give us some insight on this alarmingly high obesity, perhaps, or is it not alarming, or uh, issue related to high blood pressure, which most of the people are very much are concerned in the region. Over to you, David. First, I want to say congratulations to Dr. Mansour and the Mars team. And it is a team. It takes a lot of people to do this uh, on their successful completion of wave two. Mars is now officially a longitudinal study. Uh, change over time is essential to the study of aging. And I look forward to more waves of Mars and, and more analyses uh, really exploiting the longitudinal quality of the study. Congratulations also because the COVID pandemic created challenges for all the longitudinal studies of aging all over the world. Um, I applaud the Mars team for working through it. COVID made our surveys harder to do, but also made it more important to do them. Um, these studies of aging are just really more important than ever in view of the much greater health impact of COVID on older people. So you asked uh, about hypertension, and indeed that was one of the things I, I was most intrigued by and, and wanted to comment on. Uh, it's a very common condition all over the world. Um, at about 36%, if I understood the figure correctly, looking at the men and women comparison, um, that's uh, a good bit lower uh, than the US, which is at 55%. Um, however, as Dr. Mansour pointed out, and I think this is an incredibly important lesson, having real physical measures and real biomarkers in these studies is just a very strong complement to what we learn from asking people so when you ask people, has a doctor told you you have hypertension, in Malaysia, about 36% say yes. But when you go to the people who said no, and you measure their blood pressure, it turned out almost a third of them, 30%, uh, had high blood pressure. So they just have not to a doctor or have not had it correctly diagnosed or chose not to pay attention to that diagnosis. There are many possible reasons. Um, but that's another 19% of the population. So when you add those two together, it comes to 55% uh, overall in Malaysia, which looks more like the U.S. Now, in the U.S., it's true, there are also a few people who uh, say they don't have hypertension, who when we measure their blood pressure, it is high, but that's only about 5%. So the difference between the U.S. and Malaysia looks very large when you just ask people if the doctor told them, but when you add the biomarker measurement, they're much closer together. Now, is that good news for Malaysia? Maybe not. Um, it, it poses this question about uh, the health problem. And clearly, obesity and obesity-related conditions, particularly hypertension and, and diabetes, are uh, big problems, uh, and particularly so for countries that are um, beginning uh, or midway through economic development. They've been problems for a while in the developed countries. There may be not such a big problem in countries that are still very poor, but in countries that are developing and developing rapidly, it's a, it's a big problem. Uh, fortunately, um, there are good medications for both of those treatments if the medical system is able to diagnose and, and get those uh, out to people. Um, I'll just note one other small thing which I noticed um, in the uh, chart about self-rated health. So this is a very common question. All the studies ask, how's your health? Uh, you ask your friends that, you ask your parents that. It's a very common question. How people answer really varies culturally and, and by place. So in the U.S., for someone to say my health is fair is a bad answer. They, they think they're sick. They have some problems. In Malaysia, 40% or something are saying their health is fair, which to me means in Malaysia, the way that word is interpreted and I don't know the language, so I can't say, but it seems as though people are thinking that's okay. It, it means maybe, you know, it's not as good as it could be, not as good as it was 20 years ago when I was younger, but, you know, they're not saying I'm really in trouble, whereas in the U.S. it's much more of a negative. So it's hard to compare those kinds of things, which is, again, why knowing who has what conditions and measuring the biomarkers is so valuable for doing good international comparison. Um, maybe I'll stop there and we can come back if there's more questions. Thank you, David. And this, uh, you know, persistent morbidity that people, older people have to go through uh, has a greater implications on the need for the care. 
and that uh, Mars had some, some striking finding about the current state of the caregiving and also the expectation about the care receiving. And perhaps uh, Meredith, our uh, expert on the aging care, can uh, comment on that, as well as any other point you first noticed from the report. Over to you, Meredith. Thank you both, and thank you for the excellent presentation. And as somebody who works to support uh, policies and planning in this area, um, surveys like these are so crucial. It really is um, quite hard to find alternative sources of data on this population, and it's a very heterogenic uh, population. We're looking at age 40 to plus 80. It's a large um, part of the, um, the life course. And it's really an old age that we see both sort of advantages and disadvantages that have been accumulated from very young age really play out. And that came through quite strikingly, I think, in this study. Um, just a couple of sort of immediate reflections on the report um, before I talk about the care, the chapter on care. I really think surveys like this really help inform the discussion and overcome some of the perhaps um, assumptions that people have about how older people are living their lives in terms of, um, you know, working rates. There's often an assumption that older people do stop work, but we see that's very strongly uh, disproven in this. Also, the contributions that they make to their households as well. Um, and I think that this report really highlights, and one of the things I really liked was actually it shows from age 40, 50, 60 onwards, and you can start to see some trends, probably need a bit more evidence, maybe the next wave we'll see if these trends are holding up, but it starts to indicate some of these trends. Um, one of the ways that we tend to use these reports in planning for care is really to look at the data on sort of functional ability and really around um, the sort of reports on activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living to try and indicate and plan um, care services, who might need care, where they will be, what age should targeting of care services start start to happen, and so forth. It was quite clear in your report, um, and similar to many other countries, that it seems that women, there's quite a strong gender dimension here, and that women have much higher uh, reports of um, difficulties with activities of daily living and instrumental days of daily living. What I thought was very interesting is really some of these trends that were highlighted in the presentation um, as well, um, was actually that given that this is such a, um, a dynamic population and um, as was highlighted, Malaysia's aging so quickly, was actually the trends around expectations on care. Um, there did seem to be, whilst uh, people in their 70s and 80s have a reluctance to perhaps um, accept formal care services or support from outside the families, it seemed that that um, is going to change quite quickly. People in their 40s and 50s um, were more, seemed to be more willing to accept. Um, also came, what came through very strongly was the very strong preference for people to age in place, age in their homes and communities. And of course that has implications on um, the support from the families, but it also has implications on how those communities are designed to enable people to age in place, looking at housing, transport, um, access to those services as well. Um, one of the points I'd like to, I thought was interesting was on the support for the maintenance, the legislation to maintenance, the support of uh, children to adults. Obviously a number of countries in the region do have um, legislation, Singapore, China, Bangladesh, India, I think all have such legislation. Um, just I'd say two caveats around that. One, it is quite hard to implement, and I think that was raised. It is it can be very hard to implement um, that. But the second point I thought was interesting um, was there is quite a marked increase in the number of adults without children. Um, it doubled from the age, I think it's about 10% of people in, the, in about 40 don't have children. And this is going to be a growing dynamic that's going to have implications for care and support systems. Um, and of course, the effectiveness of any, any um, legislation on maintenance of parents. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. Uh, just on that, we have a question from the floor from the Min Min Lei. Uh, perhaps this can be more directed to Noma. So, Based on this finding, what, what are the sort of more concrete proposal that you would be 
uh, bringing to the Malaysian government in terms of the care with your findings? Um, yeah, we, um, in fact, um, care and the care economy as a whole um, is gaining uh, um, momentum in terms of uh, public discussions yeah, and, and among the government. Uh, in fact, for budget 2024, uh, there was a group yesterday that, that discussed on uh, what could the government do uh, with regards to the silver, silver economy and, and care especially. So uh, our input to the government is that um, we have to uh, look carefully at what, as, as a nation, I think it has to be a public, uh, a, a national conversation around, lo uh, around long-term care because um, relying on the uh, public care is, is very limited. And of course, uh, one way is to encourage to have more, uh, uh, what we call in Malaysia, the old folks home, yeah? uh, to have more of those because, uh, and you have the private ones, which is very expensive. Yeah, so the discussions is around how to make it more accessible, and also um, I've led a team uh, with uh, ISIS Malaysia, and we're putting up to the government that long term care is uh, or care is a public good, so it has to be uh, more accessible, um, and it it should be a right of, of every citizen uh, to to be entitled to uh, long term uh, to care as do as they grow old. Um, so these are, uh, and, and what are the options? Yeah. So uh, one is in terms of public policy, the other one in terms of how do you dispense or how do you implement uh, in order for us, for, for Malaysians uh, to feel that uh, care is a public good. Uh, it's not just limited to only very, very poor yeah, who can go into the old folks home or the rich who can afford the private health care. Thank you, Norma. Thank you. Let me now uh, turn to the uh, second part of your presentation, which you focus quite a bit on the impact of COVID. And it seemed to have two uh, aspects. One is more subjective, how people have coped, and other is on the social assistance that is provided. Uh, perhaps uh, this question more goes to the Meredith and Norma. Uh, we have uh, one question perhaps I can first address to Nomad. Uh, some of the audience is interested to know what were the exact packages that went to the seniors in the form of assistance? Uh, that's the question from uh, Antonio on the floor. And that the uh, um, second question is perhaps to the Meredith, which I would go over, is, um, is this uh, issue of uh, targeting that uh, in this survey, you would see some uh, good targeting, but also not targeting to the people who might need. It, there's a targeting uh, errors, both inclusion and exclusions. Uh, perhaps we can uh, elaborate on that a bit of it. Uh, go ahead, Melma. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, the package is not, uh, um, not focusing on just um, uh, uh, older persons, yeah? Uh, is for um, what they, they started with bottom 40% of the population and it goes up to the middle 40. So the um, this is for individuals, yeah? But the um, support, uh, the existing support um, without before COVID was what we call the old, um, old age uh, pension, which is only for the, the core, hardcore poor. So it's about... 3% of the old age population. So it's very small. But the um, uh, the, the um, COVID-19, uh, specifically COVID-19 social assistance was to a household, not to individuals, but household, household who are in the bottom 40% uh, of the income category, income group in Malaysia. And, uh, and later it was also expanded to youth and um, the middle 40% of the uh, household. Uh, in whose uh, household group. Okay. Thank you, Norma. And over to you, Meredith, if you could elaborate a little bit more on this uh, targeting issue, perhaps uh, both about Malaysia from the finding or uh, from other countries' experience, that would be useful. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Aiko. Um, just, I, I was struck by some of the findings of the report that there's actually quite a high number of people who either didn't get information or couldn't access this. This is something that we saw quite common um, across many countries um, in COVID, especially as many of the um, application processes suddenly transferred to digital. 
and obviously a lot of the communication about these was often shared on social media as well. Um, I don't know what the situation was in Malaysia, but we did see that this did exclude some of the older populations in other countries um, in terms of how they get their information and their ability to access um, application forms digitally. So having some, um, I'm in Thailand, so they did have alternative mechanisms of doing this all in person as well, even at the height of the um, COVID pandemic to help people, um, especially older persons or other people who might be uh, challenged in that area. Um, just on the social assistance, I'm sort of struck, not specifically in COVID, but from this report, there does seem to be a stark um, lack of regularity of income for many of the older persons in Malaysia. I was struck by the the lack of financial planning or planning around the retirement, um, the, the social assistance, um, the COVID social assistance being one off. And as, as Professor Norm has just highlighted, very, very limited um, number of people uh, pre-COVID got that old age allowance. Um, what we do see in many other countries is a sort of a, that multi-tiered pe uh, pension system that really provides a, a zero pillar so some uh, basic pension or income benefit to all older people then complemented by sort of social security and private pensions to allow at least some regular income to um, all older people. Um, in, terms of the, in terms of the targeting, um, again, you know, as we all recall, COVID is a very stressful time. So in terms of reducing the eligibility criteria and expecting higher sort of uh, um, Sort of more willingness for uh for people to be included in schemes rather than strict exclusion was also a way of um doing that i can't really reflect on the malaysia example um, uh, um as i wasn't um there um but just the only thing i would say is that we did see in covid the countries that had much um had sort of universal pension schemes um did use those as a way of expanding social assistance very very quickly um, to the to the uh, population. They were they were well used as a as a social assistance scheme that could be easily um, expanded. And of course, one of the advantages of the pensions it is quite easy. It's relatively easy uh, to target if you're targeting on age or on access on um, pension accessibility as well. So they can be a relatively easy tool to scale up um, quickly in emergencies such as COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. And uh, this use of a uh, transfer, if the country already have those channels to quickly transfer, that has seen great success in doing that. So adjusting to, to, to the COVID mode from the original state is uh, something that we also find in other countries. Um, another impact, which is more subjective part, is also revealed in the Mars. And that, uh, uh, Noma, your presentation shows how all the person have severed or coped with uh, different uncertainties, less communications, um, et cetera. But if you look at the closer in the report, you would see the gradient over age. And actually, all the persons seem to have, uh, you know, have, a CV, have, have uh, experienced those concerns possibly lesser or not particularly in a bigger extent than other younger future cohort of the older person. And that, that, that comes as a some, somewhat surprising, knowing that at the onset of the COVID, a lot of people talked about, oh, it's all the person who's been excluded, not meeting families. How about their mental health concerns? So uh, I would like to direct this question to David on this uh, mental health and the COVID uh, issues uh, around the world, as well as in the US. Over to you. Future older. I think I'm going to call myself future old. COVID was a really interesting experiment in the psychological state of uh, older people and, and in the context in which they live. So I, I found really nothing surprising in, in what Norma showed us. Um, people did experience loneliness. People did experience the sense of being cut off and sadness about missing family events and so on. Um, but one of the things that's kind of a truism in aging research is that by the time people get old, at least, um, they are psychologically more resilient. They they don't experience the highs and the lows that younger people do. So they're not 
uh, as prone to strong reaction, which is not to say that we shouldn't be concerned about them or that their mental health is not something to take seriously, but um, it's not unusual to see uh, older people weather difficult times uh, with less impact seemingly than others. The same is true on the economic side, because um, in many of these countries, perhaps not all the uh, countries you deal with in the Asian Development Bank, but in many countries, um, older people have a fairly stable source of income. It does not depend on a job. So jobs are very vulnerable. And so when there's turmoil in the economy or society, people who, who need jobs or have to go to sell things their lives can be upended, but someone who gets a regular check from their retirement or from the government or where it was from, they go on. So we had a, in the U.S. what was called an economic impact payment, in which was kind of like uh, a tax credit that we've used in the past to try and stimulate the economy. Um, and we followed that in the HRS. And what did people do with it? And most people knew they got it and they had it. But most of them said, you know, I can't spend it. <laughs> There's nothing I want to go spend it on. Some of them gave it to their children. Some of them put it in the bank. Um, and, the, you know, it had all these kinds of, uh, of effects. But they, they didn't feel they needed to use it to compensate for hardship in, in their lives. So on the economic side, so maybe conversely to the health side, the elderly were not as much affected maybe as the younger people. On the mental health side, um, I, I don't think there's a big age difference. I mean, it, it just depends. I mean, losing a job is horrible uh, psychologically, but so is not being able to see your grandchildren. So uh, all, all ages suffered in, in different ways um, uh, psychologically. Um, but overall, uh, and, and may, there may be other countries in which it was much harder and people expressed much greater pain, but um, in the in the U.S., people seem to have um, gotten through it more or less intact uh, in terms of their mental health. Thank you. It's a resilience that uh, is observed. It's something that is, uh, you know, we, we kept in mind and also something that perhaps we can even uh, tap on that, uh, you know, uh, that uh, they, they could be also a good uh, community uh, builders in, in weathering this kind of shocks. So it really highlights potential roles of an older person in that that the fact that we have sort of pictures quite a bit on the vulnerability side is something that we also have to be mentally uh, changing our perspective about the older person. And there are very strong resilience that we observe uh, during the COVID. Let me then uh, turn to our uh, last set of questions before we turn to some of the questions posed in the Q&A, which is about the role of survey. Actually, we have also one question from the floor asking, is there some models that you have that can feed such survey finding into the policymaking process? So this is perhaps a question to Norma and David as to how structurally you're using this survey finding for the policy makings. Do you have any platform to do that? Do you have any good examples to show, maybe in your country or elsewhere, which are also insightful for some participants? So maybe I start with Norma, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Aiko. But if I could touch on the um, the earlier uh, uh, question from David, uh, uh, also uh, the continuation from there, that I think if we dig deeper into the, um, delve deeper into the uh, analysis of the uh, uh, MARS survey, it indicates that the older persons in Malaysia also tend to live with their family, yeah? So whereas the younger ones uh, are uh, um, on their own or nuclear uh, family. So that is the other, uh, um, the other aspect or the other reason why the older persons are feeling less lonely. So at least the one, um, they are living with at least one child. Yeah, that, that's what we found. Uh, okay, indeed, yes, we have uh, done our, um, we have presented to the government ministries. Um, we have done a presentation to the um, technical meeting group for community development, Ministry of Women, Family and Community Development. Uh, there's also a technical committee for national senior citizen at the, um, the economics committee chaired by the deputy prime minister. Uh, we've, we've also uh, um, uh, shared the findings when we are doing courses with the civil servants and, and policy makers, um, and, and especially um, on social protection. So we bring in the findings of the other 
uh, of uh, the other aspects of Mars of uh, uh, questionnaires as well. And we have um, we have got collaborated. We are collaborating with um, um, the. Um, we are part of the Gateway to Global Aging, yeah, and um, also we are a part of the Global Global Alzheimer's Association Interactive Network. So I think these are some of the um, uh, agencies, and also the Ministry of Finance, and um, the most uh, recent is with the National Institute of Health Malaysia, yeah, who are uh, also using our data uh, in order to see uh, uh, the the the. Um, the socioeconomic determinants of health uh, as well. Yeah. So uh, this uh, data has been uh, uh, quite useful and I'm hopeful that uh, more uh, government agencies will be looking at mass data for their planning in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, over to you, David, if you can share with us more uh, uh, how, how these data are used uh, globally. One thing about all the family across the world of, of these studies, they're done by scientists. This is a scientific research enterprise. And that's really important um, <laughs> because uh, it, it makes them richer in addressing more things. As such, their primary audience is researchers, people who are going to use it to do things. Now, someone in the Q&A asked about models built on the data. Um, we don't, as part of the data collection enterprise, construct our own models to use them, um, but others do. So um, Chris Murray's group that does health metrics in Washington State, uh, Seattle, um, uses HRS data in their modeling. Uh, the future elderly model at USC is a model built off of HRS looking at incidence and prevalence of diseases. So there, there are people who do modeling who use these, these things. It does work that way. Um, but they're scientific products. Um, however, the HRS in the US is partly funded by the Social Security Administration because it relies on HRS to do its evaluations of the well being of the elderly. Uh, it supports research based off of the HRS, um, but it also directly supports the HRS. The ELSA survey in England is funded partly by the NIA in the US and partly by government departments, health pensions and so forth in England uh, to help them understand what's going on with the older population. So they all these agencies have a strong interest. In the US, the Congressional Budget Office, which does the scoring of proposals, you know, how what's the impact going to be of a particular tax or, or policy, um, they use the HRS uh, in, uh, in their modeling. Um, just recently, there was a paper published by the General Accountability Organization. They were asked to look at retirement plans and particularly at social disparities and who had good you know, private pensions. And um, they relied first on the government survey, the Survey of Consumer Finances, which is kind of the gold standard for measuring wealth in the United States. But it was inadequate to look at the social dimension of who had these things. They did a good job of measuring in their sample, but they had to turn to HRS to understand the social differences. And that's because these studies are very multidisciplinary. So if government, when they go out to measure something, they go out and measure that, and they rarely measure a bunch of other things that they don't think are relevant. Um, but we do, because we think everything's relevant. And so that means that when you want to take something from over here and put it together with something from over here, you can do it in these studies in a way you can't with a, a government-run survey typically. So um, I think that's a real benefit that government eventually comes around to see and they will utilize these surveys. Um, but in the startup, there's often a conflict because they'll say, oh, if we want to study pensions, we know how to study pensions. Um, or if we want to study health, we know how to study health. But putting them all together, that's that's what these studies do that most government studies on their own would not do. Thank you, David. It's 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 quite it's something that we also hope to advocate that while ADB has supported um, these uh, supporting sort of a setting up of uh, aging survey across developing Asia, which is gradually aging, it will be important for the government to embrace this initiative and keep going for the decades to come because it's it's very critical that it remains as a panel, it tracks people, and that uh, because. Uh, future old are different from the current old, especially in Asia where rapid health improvement and the education uh, profile have changed, this would be critical. So this is something that we also uh, hope to advocate from uh, ADB side. 
So for the last remaining minutes, I would like to take some questions from the um, audience. The first question perhaps comes to Meredith uh, or uh, Norma, perhaps David, jump in if you like. Um, how to balance the facility care home versus day activity center? Uh, uh, perhaps uh, Meredith, you, you could uh, share some experiences from the country who are choosing these options or mixing these options? Okay, so um, I think I think on that, it really is the importance of having a continuum of services um, that can provide care and support as people age. So it could be anything from um, sort of active aging programs from a day, a day center through to um, day care centers, through to home care support and support services to care homes. To be honest, many many countries um, they have a they have a target or an estimate of um, what percentage of older persons might require um, some residential care. Um, maybe in the last uh, one or two years of life, um, ranges between about three to six percent of the um, older population usually. And so there are sort of uh, estimates that we can use this data. Um, also the Mars data to help qualify, but in terms of that planning, in terms of the mix of services, there's some rough estimates. And of course that then can be um, consulted with uh, the population um, as terms, in terms of their preferences. I would just like to come in on, the, on an earlier question that uh, Professor Norma asked. Um, it was the question on uh, aged care and the um, and how Malaysia, the discussion on this being part of the um, long-term care, being part of the public good, that is, absolutely crucial because this has been highlighted um, and this is what we see in many countries in the region you know the people persons who have the ability to pay can get access to services and there's a very small number of people who would get some public services but there's a huge missing middle in this and this does really need a public debate as to the role of the government, families, communities, um, not just in terms of developing those services, but more fundamentally how those services will be financed uh, going forward. And that's quite a lot of the work that ADB is doing in a number of member countries at the moment. Thank you. Just to add to that, Meredith, before I pass to the Norma, there was a question on the role of private sector, especially in the Malaysia um, or, or elsewhere. How, how would the private sector then sort of play a role. We, we have been discussing a lot about sort of using this data for government policies, but private sectors perhaps also need uh, similar data. I was also reflecting on that when looking at the care data. I think, you know, this is an area where the private sector can see opportunities. They'll be able to use this data to see um, the geographical areas where people, if they're, while those, while the financing systems develop, where the people might have um, the ability to pay for services where they can partner with governments on this and also different models. I, I do think things like housing, et cetera, will change over the next uh, 10, 20 years looking at this data. So there's also sort of areas for um, private sector to come in and use this data to really see some business opportunities coming ahead. Is, is this data, is, is HIS also open to the private sectors and used in the U.S.? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, so, and I've, I've spoken to groups that are interested in uh, developing long-term care facilities, assisted care, assisted living type facilities. I agree completely with Meredith. The, the need going forward is, is for a diversity of kinds of service. It's not all about one kind of facility or one kind of arrangement. People's needs are different and, and having a flexible approach uh, is desirable and often the private sector is better at doing that it's just that it's uh, not always profitable um, finding a system in which um, the, uh, people can get the kind of care they need uh, at a price they can afford is this challenge no one yeah uh, um, can I take one or two uh, the questions that were raised earlier as well yeah Aiko um, that you talked about how uh, the ADB and some international organizations are supporting some of these initiatives in in different countries yeah and and hopefully the government will pick it up uh, we are working very closely with the Department of Statistics Malaysia and we hope that for the third round uh, although um, before going on our own with Mars data and with our funders, 
uh, uh, yeah, we did uh, uh, communicate uh, with the uh, government agencies, and I think, um, but now with the findings, I think they see the um, the, the usefulness, the benefits of the output, yeah, and 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 um, the Department of Statistics Malaysia has agreed that they will support with three of the um, of our data. To balance uh, the to the question on balancing uh, um, the facility, the retirement uh, facilities, either uh, fully institutionalized or going for um, getting services, social services while at home, I think uh, as Meredith and, and David also were saying that we should we could should have a variety of this. But I think in the Malaysian case, um, more are keen towards strengthening the families as well, uh, i.e. If uh, social assistance for old age or the type of social pension that you have in other countries are made available to majority to the majority of Malaysians, older Malaysians, then family can support them while they're at home and perhaps getting social services to come in when they need to go to work or doing part part time work, uh, uh, just in case the income or the social pension is not enough uh, for the family's. Uh, um, uh, expenditure yeah so um we are the discussions is around that it is the continuum yeah and and involving the community as well because the ngos and also religious organizations yeah in, in malaysia we also have religious organizations who are also active in doing some of the social work um and those are the options that we're looking at as well and the third question that i call you mentioned about the private sector the work at uh, swrc is also shared with the private sector and we could see more of them coming to assess our data. Um, one good example was we, we launched the reference budget and uh, some uh, organizations are already using our figures to even uh, uh, guide their borrowers uh, to, to borrow, uh, to get car loans, for instance. So uh, we're hoping more uh, of this, um, of private sector to use our data. Uh, and uh, this certainly as a uh, lot of, business in this as well. Now we're talking about the care economy uh, uh, is, is coming up very strongly in Malaysia. So I think um, more and more of the uh, private sector business yeah, will uh, come and uh, use our data. Thank you. Thank you, Norma. Uh, I know we have a few more questions regarding particularly on uh, the no longer working life or where to invest, but that sort of a time has been up. So uh, we hope to uh, continue uh, having this type of seminar that discusses uh, the well-being of older persons in the future. So uh, please, please uh, stay attuned to further seminars. And if you have other comments, uh, please do feel to email us or to the, uh, and we are happy to connect that to the uh, panelist as well. So with this, we conclude uh, today's uh, seminar and we thank the panelists and the presenter for uh, this opportunity. And before we close, let me also uh, announce the next uh, in Asian Impact, Impact webinar, which is on the Asian Development uh, Outlook September 2023 launch. It will be done in the 20th September. So please uh, register uh, to take part in this uh, webinar. Thank you very much.